the genius of the cell. Nobody ever looks at living cells. We're made of them, we're composed of them. They're the most important things in the world to us. But there aren't any television programs about them. There are very few books about them. It's very, very difficult to find out anything about what goes on. And the BBC, who have the most fabulous reputation for natural history programs, never, ever cover this one. When I first started out, there was so much of the natural world we were unable to film. The cameras, the lighting, the size of the equipment, all meant that the extremely small, the very large, the ultra-fast, or the infinitesimally slow, were beyond our reach. In the last 30 years, things have changed out of all recognition. We can now film everything, from the giants of the world's oceans to the smallest invertebrates. Now that isn't quite true. David Attenborough, whom I our paths across from time to time, is a very great friend, and I could not tell you how much I respect this man. His knowledge, his humility, his grace, his sheer professionalism. But we can't film everything. The BBC has holes in what it shows us. And if you'd like to go to their site, you can see the various kinds of organism that they have shown in their television programs. It basically says, come to this page, then click on your, your favorite life form, whichever animal you want, and scroll down until you find what it is that you're looking for. And you end up with worms, and then it stops. And yet the world that matters is smaller than worms, and they don't appear anywhere on that site. Go to Google, type in the words living cell, and you get thousands and thousands of pages, and none of them show living cells. These are all computer graphics, or tables, or models, or diagrams, or charts, or sections of dead cells that have been saved. And I had to search a long time before I came across a television program that actually showed a micro image. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is not quite a documentary, but it's the best example I could find. Are you aware that you've exposed your skin to a whole host of airborne debutifiers? Mom! This dermal magnifier will show the extent of the damage. <gasps> He's eating my beauty! Try this rejuvenating lotion. It contains over 60 ingredients. Whoa! Oh, yeah. I hope he didn't have children. Did he have children? Millions of them. <laughs> there we are, the citizens to my rescue. And I found a great example in the Czech Republic. It is a laboratory commercial, which also shows microbes in the familiar way that we get used to seeing them on television. <laughs> Co to tu boni, a je to tak, tak. Osiežujúce! Čože? Nový Domestos Bakti Stop! Nikdy sa mi nič také osiežujúce necíti! Vyblázni, veď nás to zabíja! Nový Domestos Bakti Stop likviduje baktérie a zároveň osiežuje. And it gets worse. I went into a, an American museum where they had a section of what life was like under the microscope. And this was their picture. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. And what about this one? From a poster. Not only have they got these amazingly wackily distorted pictures with cartoon faces, but in the corner it says, magnifying times 100. To make you think this is what cells really look like. So, let me take you to wherever I like to be. A bit of stagnant water. If you see stagnant water, you think that it is. Keep away, you'll catch something nasty, the water is stagnant. Well, you're most unlikely to find germs in stagnant water, strange as that may seem. But what you do see is the majesty of microscopic life. And when I see a sight like that, I think, oh, wow, will we see? This is just a speck of pond water under the microscope. And just look at this busy community of little eucleinoid cells all swimming around, communicating with each other, looking for food, nuzzling about. You won't find this on television. It never is on television. It is quite extraordinary for all the importance of these little things that we never get to see them. And what about these pretty things? This is Volvox. This is one of the first microbes ever to be seen 
in 1674 by Megalogue, the Dutch pioneer of the microscope, the first man to discover this incredible universe of James Each of these spheres is a couple of hundred little cells all beating together with two little sticking up heads, little flagella that, that beat and cause the whole spheres to turn around and rotate as they go floating serenely through the water. We can take one of these little colonies and, and look at it under time lapse to speed it up and you can see all the activity that's going on. And notice that all those little groups of cells are coordinated. They're all moving at the same speed. In some odd way, they coordinate their movements. And they are everywhere. You've very likely seen this sight in a bird bath in your garden when it's gone a rusty brown. And the reaction is, oh, well, there we are. Obviously, the concrete is breaking down. It's got to a bit of the reinforcing iron, and the water's going rusty. No, it's not going rusty. This is an organism that lives in bird baths. Put a little drop of that water out of the microscope. This is what you see. These exquisite, round, beautiful little cells called hematocomers. And here's one of the high power. You can see it lives inside this jelly-like envelope. And at the front it has these two amazingly beating flagella, which whisk around like lashes in the water and propel it as it moves through its busy little life. Go to the seaside. You might see on the rocks brown, slimy stuff, and it, I hate to think what you might imagine it was. But let's put a little drop of that under the microscope. And what we see is this community of beautiful, gliding diatoms. These exquisite little creatures create an inner skeleton of themselves out of glass. And the brown, the blobs inside, are blobs of oil. Just as potatoes and many temperate plants store their energy in forms of starches, these store their energy from the form of oil. And it's the great beds of these creatures, which I believe gave us our beds of crude oil to this day. So these little diatoms are actually producing the original oil on which the whole of modern society is predicated. And yet, you don't find microbes on television. And when they're mentioned, they're not even liked. Now, Brian Cox, the physicist, the ubiquitous physicist, with whom I was lecturing at the Cheltenham Science Festival, last year, and we last spoke then. And he appeared on Jonathan Ross's program, talking about the lakes of water that you might find on Europa out in space, and whether that meant there might be life. And Jonathan's response is very interesting. It's, it's very cold out there, half a billion miles away from the sun, but it's got a liquid ocean underneath it, which is probably about 100 kilometers deep. So fish means, and stuff we might well, find? It means there's more water on that moon than in all the oceans of the Earth put together. That, and once again, big headache time yeah, for me. <laughs> but will there be fish in there? And, uh, well, there could be microbes. Uh, well, most, many people think there'll be at least microbes. Yeah, but microbes, microbes don't count. We want things with arms, eyes. I know. That's what we're interested in. But microbes would be, would be a start. No, no they would. microbes! <laughs> Is that it? No more microbes, says Ross. Indicating that, that what you want to think of eyes and, and limbs. And what about this? This guy, a games, a computer games designer, who built a game called Spore, which is all about controlled evolution. Look to see what he had to say. This game's I've been working on it for several years. It's getting pretty close to finish now. And you actually start this game kind of in a drop of water. It's a very, very small single cell creature. And right off the bat, you basically just have to live, survive, reproduce. So here we are at a very kind of microscopic scale, swimming around. And I actually realized that cells don't have eyes, but uh, it helps to make it cute. He said, I know that cells don't have eyes, but it makes it kind of cute. Cells do have eyes. A lot of single cell organisms have eyes. Here's one. You're going to this is a, a, a group of them. Let's have a look at one under the high power microscope. And there it is. And that red blob at the top, as you can see, is its eye. A lot of single celled microscopic creatures do have eyes. If we take a section of the cell and look at it under the electron microscope, you can see the curved retina, very much like the retina we have in our own eyes. Here's a little creature called Phagus, a protozoan organism, rather like a tubby table tennis, back to the shape. Very swimming along, that little red dot at the front of its eye, and if we take two of them and track them in a very thin field of water, you can see these two cells with their little red eyes. And in some strange way that we don't begin to understand, of course, no idea what they see. 
This is the single cell, and on this right hand side, there, the red bulb is his eye. This is his mouth. Now, if you showed that to a child who's never looked at a microscope, the child would know exactly what it was. The child would say, This is some sort of alien creature. And you say, What sort of creature? And the child would say, No, I've never seen one like it before, so I'm just a panic. But the child would say, You would easily make out the details because here's his mouth, and there's his eye. And this is a child talking to you who's never seen down a microscope before. But even at the microscopic level, these little creatures do have some of the things that we have. So much for eyes. What about limbs? Well, look at this strange form of, of amoeba with this very thin tapering pseudopodia. And look how it's transporting food that is caught down to the cell. Look at everything that's going on. That's speeded up 30 times that you've been with a natural speed. But it's incredible to think how much life is going on inside these cells. And this is one of the most interesting sequences I'm going to show you today. This is a single-celled protosome swimming along. And you can see how he bumps into a diatom, we met diatoms just now, and decides he doesn't want to be here. But as he goes a bit further, he senses a paramecium, which he, he turns and inspects in some strange way. And then, just like a cat catching a sparrow on the lawn at home, he pounces on it and eats it. Just think of the amount of intelligence and coordination and detailed senses that this little creature needs to do this. Now, here he comes. There's a diatom up above, and he sniffs at that in some strange way, doesn't want it, and then he sees a paramecium, and after inspecting it, he wolfs it in. And you can see the little creature still swimming around inside. This is a single cell sensing its way and taking its own decisions. It isn't good enough to say that they're terribly simple, and yet when people have made documentaries about cells, they always insist that you can't see much or that the cells aren't very good. Here's a little bit from a television documentary with Dr. Mike Mosley, which, which is a perfect example of how people insist that all you can see down a microscope is a low old mush. Just watch this. The cell finally resurfaced in the mid-19th century in the research laboratories of Prussia. Even with the best microscopes, this is all they could see. A nucleus in a translucent mush. Now that's a strange coincidence. Because 20 years earlier, with Cal Gordon, I'd made a television program for the BBC in which we looked at exactly this. What's it like when you take a cell and look at it through the microscope? No staining, just a cell. And if you look back at that program, you can see how you really can see cells properly under the microscope. The onion will give us a living cell. Just take a piece of it and use that scalpel to pull away mm. a bit of the top surface of the onion. Right. That's right. Yeah. And then what do I do? Drop Just it strip back? it back towards you. Now then, you see that little tiny thin bit that's come away? Let it down yeah. on there. That's, that's the bit that's quite slimy when you cut up onions, isn't How it? How dare you speak of plant tissues like that? <laughs> now, I'm going to take a little drop of water. Now, I'm using a pipette, but, but um, uh, any old common or garden eyedropper would do for that. Right. And then, with a, a little cover slip on top, like so, mm -hmm. if we pop that under here in place of the potato, you will see life as it is lived in the raw. Inside each cell, there's one on the left and two on the right there, you can see the nucleus, which of course is the controlling part of the cell. Let's just that see if we can... right in the middle. Right? That's right. Just see if we can find a better one. Um, ah, now that is a particularly good cell. It's a perfect, typical example of a living cell. Isn't that interesting? When you put the two together, the screenshot from my program and from my places, there's the modern BBC version. It's the best they could do with that hundreds of thousands of pounds of budget to bless their little hearts. But in actual fact, this is what they should have shown, or what I showed Carol 20 years earlier. Hidden deep inside you is a wonderful, dynamic world. Vast forests of cells capture night.
tiny movements trigger fierce electrical storms. And raging turrets of blood feed your brain. a fantastic voyage through the most complex organism on earth. I'm amazed that this can be screened without producing a, an absolute chorus of protest. The reason is, of course, it's that catch-22 thing. Television companies say, we don't really want to make protests about ourselves. Why? Because the public aren't interested in them, because they never see them. And you say, well, they won't ever see them unless you make a program, will they? But because there is no demand, there is no program. And none of those ridiculous caricatures are anything remotely like cells. If you want to see some real living cells, this is what real cells are like. They're not hunks of plastic, they're not columns, they're not rods and pieces of components like machines. They're glutinous and, and sexy and soft and sensual and translucent. Look at these and me, speaking out 20 times, chasing along. There's the, the nucleus inside that dark. Well, these, these are media, they know what they're doing, they know where they're going, they work out whether they want to eat something, and they will discard it if they don't. And there's so much complexity going on. This isn't molecular biology, this is life. And living is done inside living cells. We are, we sit here now as colonies, of trillions of living cells, all coordinated. But the cells inside us are taking their own decisions and working out what it is we're going to do. Look at this end of a cell, and the beautifully choreographed way in which this silken border of the cell is trying to explore its environment and feel what exactly is going on. Here are the edges of three cells, and just look how all the time they're exploring the neighborhood and, and then pulling in cytoplasm to draw in little pieces of food or whatever it is they want. And all of the time, there is this amazingly complex sensation, response, and life going on under the microscope. I have to say that I think they are utterly beautiful. And let me show you another example of the same television genre of how the white cell is portrayed on television. The white cell is portrayed here, of course, the, the film doesn't say so. The film says these are white cells from the blood, you know, the cells that protect us against the disease. It doesn't say this is a, a mock-up, or what I would prefer to say, a dash-up. This is how it looks. Here we see the white cell, like a blob of uh, white blue cap or seeding wax, sticking up sausage-shaped appendages and grabbing sperm as they go swimming past. I mean, nothing like this happens in life, and unless you have a you're a woman who has an illness which causes sterility. I mean, if this happened in life, none of us would ever have been here in the first place, ladies and gentlemen. And they made them look white because of their name, white cell. But they're not white. They're transparent, like the more white of an egg. If you want to see a real white cell, rather than this peculiar shapeless blob, here is a famous old piece of film of a white cell, surrounded by some red cells in the blood, and he's chasing those bacteria. And in some way, he can sense those little black bacteria and is determined to catch them no matter where they go. And even when they turn to one side, he still turns around, hunts them, pushes cells to one side. In his inexorable quest, he is determined, he won't give up until, as an hour, he engulfs them and eats them and destroys them. And that's how we remain mostly free of bacterial diseases, because of these transparent white cells doing their daily work. When the BBC were going to look at how cells divide, how life begins, how a fertilized egg starts its miraculous transformation to an adult, they did it with computer graphics once again. The cell inside the egg divides in two. Both of these then divide, making four cells. Then eight, 16, and so on. Except, it's not that straightforward. 70% fail within the first six days before the woman even knows she's pregnant. When your cells first began to multiply, they clustered randomly together. I've no idea how much that costs. And all the time for nothing, 
they could have shown the film a real Excel. This is a living one. Look how different it is to the crude computer simulation. Look how, how it splits in two and how this cell goes on divided and all the cells divide at the same time. And as they do, the whole mass of this little embryo convulses. This is speeded up, of course, about 20 or 30 times. But you see how beautiful and organic it is when we look at the real thing. So why is everybody so insistent all the time on creating computer graphics? I really don't understand it. These are more like human eggs in the sense that they're translucent. These are little zebrafish eggs. Developing. There's a, a big round blob of yolk, and the little embryo forms on one side. And as the cells divide, you can see how beautifully the early embryo begins to form as a, as a disc of cells. And then how it, it folds in to produce the nerve cord, and how there's a thickening at one end, which is destined to become the head, and the thin bit at the other end. See the head forming at the top there. And there is the backbone just beginning to form at the base. You can see how you move from a single cell with this little egg sac to form a beautiful little recognizable baby fish. And once they're freed from the encompassing egg, there are these little embryonic fish. I and mean, it's an exquisite little story. The story was first told by this man, Neighbor Look, Antonio Neighbor of, of Delft, who in the 1600s, the late 1600s, made the first great discoveries of micro worlds. The BBC thought they would look at what it is that he did. And so they sent a young reporter to the Netherlands to have a look at how Lady Hook did his work. And there is one little bit here I do want you to watch out for. That is when the, the presenter says, um, well, what am I looking at here? And Hans Jonker, the man who made the little model microscope, says, you're looking at the wrong side which for me is the highlight of this little piece of memorable television. Van Leeuwenhoek built a staggering 247 microscopes, a new one every couple of months for over 50 years, and told nobody how he made them. We've placed a drop of lake water onto a slide that slots into the device. With a bit of luck, I'll be able to see what Van Leeuwenhoek saw. What, what do I actually do? Where am I looking? Uh, at the wrong side, mm -hmm. you must look through this hole. Yep, I, I can see green. There is a focusing knob. There's a focus? Yes, there is a focusing knob. Yeah, that works. That really works. It's now in focus. Oh, wow! Oh my god, you can actually see moving creatures. Yes. Oh god, that's incredible. There's a tiny, tiny bug in there, which is scooting around, which I guess is a protozoa. That's astonishing. Yes, it is astonishing. It's astonishingly bad. <laughs> Oddly enough, in a program that's just around in Korea, I was asked to demonstrate this, and you may like to see this because it shows you what you should have been able to see through one of those little microscopes. Netherlands' animal scientist. 안톤 판 레벤 후크. You would not think this could be a microscope. If you have a look, that is an exact copy of the microscope that Leeuwenhoek had in the 1600s. You could focus it with these screws, so you would then hold it towards light. Until Leeuwenhoek, with his little microscope, saw microorganisms, nobody ever realized that the world was filled with billions, trillions of tiny living creatures that affect our everyday. 바로 미생물의 세계였습니다. First, they thought, he's wrong, he's exaggerating, he's imagining things. But then in time, they realized that this Dutchman was the first person in history to realize there is an invisible universe which we'd never seen before. It is quite interesting to look at these two bits of film together. Um, the, the bit at the bottom is a, a film that I made. Curiously, I've been seen with you, 
would you be able to make some videos through these early microscopes? And that it had never been done before in the world. And it was because of that request that I carried out these wonderful experiments and showed what you could see back in the 1600s with a tiny lens in a microscope that lens no bigger than the head of a pin. And all the bee could do was to show this fuzzy blur, which is hardly better than you would see with the naked eye. In, in the end, the BBC never commissioned the series. Though other countries are always interested, and here's another example from Asia. This is from Channel News Asia, a, a, a few extracts from the program. <laughs> and lecturer Dr. Brian J. Ford from having a long-lasting impact on science. Well, he has done research on mad cow disease and even had laws changed because of his discoveries. Now, we had a chance to speak to him when he was in Singapore to deliver a distinguished visitor's lecture at the Singapore Science Centre. Well, one of the uh, key studies that you have done and that's made really um, headlines in the world of science is intelligent cell. What did you mean by that? There are some amoebae, and I'm doing studies of these at the moment mm -hmm. uh, in England. There are some amoebae that that construct a home for themselves. They pick up things like tiny specks of sand and cement them into a beautiful uh, vase-shaped house in which they live. And sometimes you can look at cells under the mm -hmm. microscope and see that they've been damaged. And the way that they repair themselves by actually carrying out reconstruction work is much more than just a simple chemical system. Mm -hmm. Some cells within the cell have a tiny eye. You know, when science is explained so easy in terms that we can easily understand, isn't it fascinating? Yeah. And now, one of the examples I mentioned there was the way in which some amoebae, not so simple as we think, some amoebae build a home for themselves. Here's an example. There's a, a scanning electron microscope picture on the left and a drawing I've done on the right of a shell, which this little amoeba called different years. Like, this is the amoeba here, hanging out at the bottom of this shell. That one is a, a, a dead and empty one. I have in fact spoken on these on this stage in the past. And I think somebody became aware of this fascinating research because believe it or not, it turned up on BBC2 in an extremely interesting context. And I want you to watch the reaction of the panelists. Because producers always say, I don't think people are going to find this interesting, or people don't really want to know. Well, just take a look at this and see what the likes of Bill Bailey. And it is up, I have to say. When an amoeba splits up, who gets the house? Oh, I see. Who gets the house? Well, yes, I they... thought the whole idea was that they split, they get two houses. It's you... some sort of perfect world of... Do you know what sort of houses amoebas can build? I mean, they're single-celled, and you... it's just yeah. part of the amazing nature of all living creatures is that even incredibly simple ones, like an amoeba, you don't get much simpler, can actually build a, Prote a protective a house. They assemble yeah. grains of sand and they make that, oh. that protects them. Even to the spikes, those spikes are deliberate. They can, isn't it incredible? Is that, is that lo loads of grains of sand as they pull around? Yeah, each one of those. It's about the size of a full stop on an average newspaper. Wow. It's tiny. That's insane. That's a, We've never heard that before. That's a no, goal. That's, 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 that is brilliant. actually quite interesting. Hooray! What happens is the amoeba goes along as a single-celled organism and the odd bit of sand it absorbs and saves up and some it uses to build this house. And then when it's time to split, it takes away the house and the half it leaves behind has got all the building materials left so it can quickly build its own house. So that's how they split it when they, when they have a split. Why, why have we never heard of that? I don't know, I suppose, really. really? I never mean, mentioned that, it's, no, it's been should, a conspiracy to keep this information yes. from us. <laughs> Isn't that absolutely fascinating? I mean, if any producer really wants evidence of the fact that it does catch the attention, there's a good one. And if you look down the microscope at these spores being released by red algae, they're not just interesting, they're also exquisitely beautiful. If we look at this under the high power of the microscope, you can actually see how the end of the sporangium opens, and these little limpid sexual cells, these are the equivalent of sperm for the uh, are being expelled. I mean, it's, it's, it has the beauty of an oil painting to it, ladies and gentlemen. Now, let's just see how clever they can be. I want to show you just one example, I can show you so many. But here is a bro broken algal cell, it's been popped, it's burst, it's gone flat, it's empty, it's dead. It is speeded up 25 times. Well, what happens? The parent cell body reinflates it. it. It's mended the hole in some magical way. We have no idea how it does that. But it pumps it up until it's back to its original shape. Just like 
repair the tyre. Now, it's a pretty neat trick when they blow up your tyre in the garage, I agree, but you've got blokes and machines. This is just an alga taking all those decisions and working it out for itself. And to close, I'm going to show you just one more time that hunting shot of this single-celled creature and how it goes scurrying through the pond, comes across a little diatom shell, which he inspects, but he doesn't really want it. Then he suddenly senses, perhaps through movement or taste, we have no idea, a paradisium, and he leaps upon him, sensing he's hunting, he's finding his food, he's identifying what he wants to eat and neglecting what he doesn't. Because, ladies and gentlemen, living cells, as the QI panelists remind me, actually are much more interested than anybody realizes. Harry with you if you would some of these extraordinary sights, because you see them here today, but you won't see them anywhere else. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.